Tilo, what's poppin'? We are on kickkick.com. We ain't live, but you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Um, if we do go live and you miss it, this is where you can catch the highlights. Uh, don't forget, we do got merch. Appreciate everybody who's purchased some. And this is the Patreon. We upload five days a week. The link to all of this. Is in the description below. <laughs> it's under the link tree. Click it. It'll be there. Lucy Letby. I see the news. I see what's going on. I seen it late. I just literally seen it Saturday. What's today's date? August 26th. I just seen it today. <coughs> There's a whole documentary already out. I need to know from start to finish what's going on with this lady. And I'm not holding my tongue. Now to keep me calm, I am doing this video. My, my um, you know what I'm saying? My seed is behind me. She's asleep. So you're just going to see a lot of faces. And I'm gonna, I will pause, though. Don't get it twisted. Let's get into it, man. Letby is accused of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. While she was working on the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Letby denies all of the charges over the incidents. Lucy Letby was... Bro, seven babies with ten attempt and ten attempt? The only person working on the night shift that was alleged in court with their mother, who was apparently told by Miss Letby, trust me, I'm a nurse. Just over nine months ago, the trial of Lucy Letby began. She was accused of the most shocking of crimes. Wait, so this the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of ten others. She always denied all the charges. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. I was in court every day watching the trial unfold, and together we created our podcast, The Trial of Lucy Letby. We examined what happened and brought you the details behind the headlines, allowing you to be part of each moment of the trial. Okay. The podcast was groundbreaking because it was the first time in the UK that a podcast had covered a live trial week by week. You listened in your millions, and now we're going to bring you the... I feel what y'all are saying, but people do that on TikTok already. It's not groundbreaking. But salute, for, I guess, for the Daily Mail to come and do it. Yes, it is big for y'all. But freelance journalism on TikTok, they've been doing it. The inside story of what happened during the trial and how the jury reached their verdicts. This is the trial of Lucy Letby, the inside story. Thumbnail. This story starts back in 2015. Back then, David Cameron was Prime Minister, Facebook got a billion users, NASA found water on Mars, and almost 700,000 babies were born in the UK. 3,000 of them were born at the Countess of Chester Hospital in the northwest of England. But over the next 12 months, from June 2015 to June 2016, it slowly became apparent something unthinkable might be happening. Doctors noticed that there was a sudden spike in deaths and near deaths on the neonatal unit where premature and poorly babies are cared for. So they started to investigate. When they failed to find a medical reason, police were eventually called in and after an investigation lasting for more than a year, they arrested a young Band 5 nurse who had worked at the hospital for several years. In November 2020, Lucy Letby was charged with the murder and attempted murder of 17 babies. And after deliberating for 20... No, stop, stop. What type of sick, sadistic fuck does this? Like, I don't care what you got going on in your life. To take, first of all, a baby, a kid, a child is one of the innocent, most innocent things on earth. 
did nothing to you and then their parents two days the jury found Lucy let be guilty of the murder of seven babies and the attempted murder of six more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire she will go down as the most prolific child killer in British history so Liz from the minute we started work on this podcast which was back in October last year we had the whole families of every baby at the forefront of our mind. The mums and the dads, the cousins, the aunties, the uncles, the brothers and the sisters. Um, because we knew we had to do this right. They thought their child had died or been hurt or been poorly because of natural reasons, natural causes. Um, and the first they knew that this was something much more sinister was for some of them five years on when they got a knock on the door from Cheshire Police. Yeah, you can't imagine. I had to relive that whole situation because I know people take this hard anyway. I know people that have like failed, you know, failed in the stomach where it doesn't even make it and they take it real hard. So imagine having a preemie and it passing. That's heartbreaking. And then five years later, getting a knock on your door, saying it wasn't natural, somebody did that, to a, to a two-day-year-old? I can't imagine, really horrendous. And um, then a lot of them obviously had to give statements to the police, and some of them came to court themselves to give evidence and had to listen to the most awful details about what happened to their child. A nurse came up and asked whether I wanted someone to call a priest. I remember feeling quite shocked and I asked if she thought he was going to die. She responded, yes, I think so. When we got there, she was in intensive care with all the machines. It was such a shock. She looked like she was going to die. Our daughter could go from perfectly fine to nearly dying in seconds. There was no in between. Our daughter seemed to deteriorate when we left her alone and predominantly at night. I was praying to my God to see my boy and help him. I was asking my God to save him. My husband was not saying anything, but he was crying and crying. We made the decision to switch off the machines and let her go. It was by far the hardest decision of my life. Our daughter was in my husband's arms when she took her last breath and silently passed away. That audio is so hard to listen to, isn't it? Because they were the actual words of the parents yeah. who gave evidence to this court either in person, just two of them did, or in statements. And for the podcast, um, as you know, Liz, we got them voiced up by actors because one of the things we wanted to do on the podcast was to take our listeners into yeah. that courtroom to try to put them where we were. And, and to kind of put across the emotion of it being in there. You know, some of these, I'm a mum, you know, some of these mums had to get up there and, and describe what they'd seen and what had happened to their child. And obviously Lucy Letby in is in the room. Her. Yeah, she's in the room as well. And court, a courtroom is quite a scary place mm. as well. You know, if you're not used to being in a courtroom, they're austere places. I mean, the other thing... You know what? The judicial system has done their job, but she has to answer to something higher. At the end of the day, she has to answer to something higher, and she has to answer in jail too. And I know how the UK is set up. They got prisons inside of prisons to to protect high profile, you know what I'm saying, people like this. But somehow, some way, thing as well is that this was the first time these parents knew what Lucy Letby had allegedly done to the other children in this trial. Yeah, they couldn't draw the dots until they were actually there and, and watching and, you know, that moment of realisation of, you know, the full extent of the case must have been pretty horrendous. So, Liz, from the moment the jury was sworn in, that's the jury of eight women and four men for this case, which was in October last year, they were told it was going to be a long trial. I think they were told it was going to be probably six months. They didn't know they were going to give up probably the best part of a year. Of, of their lives but they were also told it was going to be complex 
And how complex was it? I mean, I've got the figures. We're talking about 5,500 police statements. We're talking about 32,200 exhibits and more than 13,000 pages of audio transcripts. And all that related to Lucy Letby, who faced 22 charges relating to 17 babies. Yeah, but, but actually, Caroline, nobody will ever know the identities of these babies that really should be at the centre of the trial. They were at the centre of the trial. Um, and that's because of the strict reporting restrictions that were on the case to protect their identities and the identities of their families. So we would call them baby A to Q. Yeah, that's right. What we do know is the whole what Lucy Letby did. The way that she attacked the babies, her modus operandi. Um, we know how she attacked them. We'll never know why she attacked them. Uh, she had a number of techniques. Uh, she used insulin to poison. Yeah. Um, she also tried to smother. Uh, one child had a really serious, mm. violent liver injury, but she had one particular method. Well, the prosecution said that her favourite method of killing and harming these babies was injecting them with air, um, and that caused an air bubble or an air embolus in their bloodstream, which blocked the blood flow and essentially killed them that way. Um, now, we don't really know what triggered this kind of killing spree. Yo. This is somebody you're supposed to trust. Like, she went to school for this. Vigorously. That she went on, but we do know that she went on a course um, which taught her how to deal with long lines and injecting medicine into um, certain cannulas. And there were prosecution speculated that maybe that was what taught her about air embolus and that's when she went on to kill baby A a couple of weeks later. Two weeks before the death of baby A, Lucy Letby completed a course relating to intravenous lines. And nobody even would think twice about her taking the course. She's a nurse. And on the course, the dangers of air embolus were mentioned. Is that just a coincidence or is that what gave her the idea? We will never know. We say Lucy Letby killed baby A with an injection of air into the bloodstream. When he collapsed, she was standing over him. She tried the same thing with his sister the following night, but miraculously, she survived. You tried to do twins like that? So baby D was another child that was injected with air. Um, she was the third baby to die um, in a fortnight yeah. in June 2015. And um, she was the, actually the only baby in the case that was full term. She wasn't mm. premature. And the reason she was there was because her mum had had a really long and difficult labour. She'd been in labour for 60 hours. And the doctors thought that um, she had an infection when she was born because she was having a few problems breathing. Mm. So that's the reason she was in the neonatal unit. Yeah, because it catered mainly for premature babies. She shouldn't have been there, really. Um, and actually, you'll remember this really well from court, Liz, that her mum... And then it was the neonatal unit because preemies, you know, it's really up in the air, really. That's, that's, this is so methodically planned, like... ...was the first parent to give evidence um, in person but one of the key things she told the court was that uh, Lucy Letby was sort of what she called hovering around Baby D's cot at one point, making her and her husband feel pretty uncomfortable. Nurses did go and get her parents to bring them to Nursery One because it was clear that their daughter was seriously ill. As we've heard, the parents had gone to rest a few hours earlier but the next thing they knew, they were woken up in the middle of the night by a nurse in a panic. Baby D's mother explained what happened next to the court and her words have been voiced here by an actor. She just said our daughter was very poorly and you need to come down. We were fast asleep, so we didn't really know what was going on. The nurse helped me get into the wheelchair and we rushed downstairs. Dr Brunton was holding her, trying to resuscitate. He was trying really hard. We were just standing there looking at her dying. Someone was holding a phone to his ear. He was quite agitated. 
and then Dr. Newby told him they had to let her go. He had to stop. She tapped him on the shoulder and said, you've got to let her go. He stopped massaging her and pronounced the time of her death and I couldn't stay in the room anymore. So I asked my husband to take me away. As a parent, that's gotta be. Just the initial thing and then to relive it again five years later to know this nurse. She like, was actually Bro, they're better than me because I would have been in the courtroom with a with the craziest zombie. I would have wanted revenge, but they're better than me. You know what I'm saying? If that's but that's I, I, I couldn't handle this. You know, I'm sure a lot of people can't. They attacked three times during that night shift. Um, and the allegation was that Lucy Letby pumped air into her bloodstream three times. And during the final attempts to save her life, when the doctor sadly couldn't resuscitate her, they noticed this strange discoloration on her abdomen and her, on her tummy. Um, and this rash, this kind of purpley, blotchy yeah. rash, became quite a feature of the case. Well, and actually, a lot of the doctors and nurses didn't know what it was. They'd never seen something like that before. The sort of flitting, they called it, flitting rash that sort of moved and came and went. Um, and they didn't know, you know what was causing it and they didn't know why it was affecting, it well, this baby, but then as it turned out... More babies. More babies. So baby E's mum also gave evidence in person to the court, didn't she? And. Um, Again, a, a sort of traumatic moment in the courtroom. But what happened in her case was that she was never meant to be at the Countess. She was meant to have her twins at Liverpool Women's because mm -hmm. there was a condition that... Should have went to Liverpool. I'm not blaming this on the hospital. Yes, I am. I'm, you really can't blame it on the hospital, but... This is like, you can't trust nobody. It's a new fear unlocked. ...been diagnosed and they were better there. But when she went into labour, um, there were no beds. So she and her husband drove the 30 miles to the Countess of Chester um, to have the twins there. And the reason we've chosen this as a key moment in the podcast was because this was one of the moments that uh, Lucy Letby was interrupted attacking one of the twins. And on this evening, um, it was a couple of days after the boys had been born and their mother was on her own actually in the hospital recovering from a caesarean and um, her husband had actually gone home because there was the, it was anticipated that the boys were gonna go or be transferred to a hospital nearer their home because, to be cared for. Because they were doing well. Because they were doing well. Yeah. And so in the, in the evening of the 3rd of August, <coughs> she'd been down to see them in the neonatal unit. She'd changed their nappy. She'd done what's called their care. So she'd kind of wiped their eyes and their neck. And then a couple of hours later, she, around nine o'clock at night, she went to deliver some breast milk. And that's when she arrived on the neonatal unit and described hearing her son screaming um, and horrendous scream it was described as, and that's when the prosecution said she, she actually interrupted Lucy Letby mid-attack. Let me hear this. I could hear my son crying, and it was like nothing I had heard before. I walked over to the incubator to see blood coming out of his mouth, and I panicked. I was panicking because I felt like there was something wrong. Was Lucy Letby near your son when you walked in? No, there was a workstation, and she was at the workstation. Just describe what you could hear. I could hear crying. What sort of crying? It was a sound that should not have come from a tiny baby. It was horrendous. It was more of a scream than a cry. How long before you walked into the room could you hear that? I could hear it in the little corridor. What was Lucy Letby doing as you walked in, hearing what you could hear? She was busy doing something, but she wasn't near my son. Off top, I would have blamed her. You don't hear my son? Like You don't hear my baby in here doing all this? Like, that, to me, that screams I'm trying to play something off. But in the moment, I guess, you know what I'm saying? You're not expecting that. You're not really thinking like that. And when um, baby E's mum actually went into the room to the cop to see him, now, he had blood around his mouth at that point, and she was really worried. But she went back to the ward because Lucy Letby told her to. Um, but later, 
when he collapsed and doctors were trying to save him, this bleeding got worse and worse. Yeah, and um, one of the doctors also noticed that he had a rash on his body and he remembered that this rash was like the one that he'd seen on baby A. And uh, sadly, they worked on him for almost 50 minutes um, and the doctors just couldn't save him and he died in the early hours. I mean, 50 minutes of CPR uh, yeah. on a tiny baby. And obviously his parents were called in and they watched a lot of that process and sadly had to watch him slip away. But we come back to the rash again. Well, this is sickening. This is sickening. That keeps coming up mm. in this trial. Yeah, what's the um, rash? Still at this point, the doctors and nurses were noticing it, but didn't know why it was there, didn't know what it meant, didn't know really that it was significant. But then... Are there no cameras in the NICU? I'm trying to think. I think there are, and... There's a moment, oh. isn't there, again, which is why we've picked this out mm. from the podcast, because it was a bit of a turning point, really, in the doctors and nurses wondering what was going on. So one of the doctors in this case, a doctor called uh, Ravi Jayram, he was a consultant. He started to research this mm. rash. Not till much later on, but yeah. A lot later on, but he then realised that this rash could be a consequence, a sign of an air embolus. Dr. Jariam said he didn't realise the clinical significance of the rash until months later, after more babies had died and it had been present in others who collapsed. He said the research paper, which the jury heard is well known among paediatricians, examined the effect of air embolus, that's air in the circulation of newborns. Meredith Grey would have caught that right away and it described almost exactly the rash and the skin discoloration that was seen on the body of baby A. I remember sitting on my sofa at home with the iPad and I remember reading that description and the physical chill that went down my spine because it fitted with what we were seeing. So it was at this point after the deaths of baby D and baby E that doctors on this unit started to look at what was going on. Yeah, because it don't make sense. You know what I'm saying? These doctors are prideful, very prideful. Some of them have God gone complexes. So when stuff going on and they losing patients, they go, they lose sleep over that, and they start obsessing over it. Like no way, let's let's get to the bottom of him. Like the same thing over and over. Because it just didn't feel right. These babies who shouldn't be collapsing yeah. and dying, uh, they were collapsing and dying unexpectedly. They were meant to be going home, they were meant to be getting better. And Dr Ravi Jayram started to look at it, along with another doctor called Stephen Breary. And the two of them started to look at what was going on. And they noticed, which is the key thing, that Lucy Letby was on duty every single time one of these babies collapsed yeah. or died. And... You gotta look for the common things. What's, what do all of these have in common? At the beginning, they just noted it down and said it was an association mm -hmm. they um, because they couldn't believe that a nurse would do this do what they called the unthinkable and attack babies and it wasn't until a few months later that they actually went to the hospital managers and said we think there's something about this nurse being on duty every single time and Dr Jayram told the court that the circumstances of baby K's collapse prompted he and Dr Breary to raise their concerns a second time to hospital managers this time the court heard they took their concerns to the medical director as well. Dr. J. I'm told the court that Dr. Breary even asked for a meeting between the consultant. How embarrassed is the hospital about this? Like, what's going on? I, I know they had to pay some crazy money, like, in, in lawsuits. I know none of that money can bring back kids or it means nothing, but I know they had to pay out crazy. And hospital managers to discuss their concerns. But they were ignored, and the pair faced pressure not to make a fuss, Dr. J. Ram said. No one came back to the consultants for another three months, Dr. J. Ram claimed. And he told jurors that, in hindsight, he wished he'd bypassed official channels and gone straight to the police himself. In court, Mr. Myers suggested it was difficult to believe that if Dr. J. Ram had witnessed what he said he had with Baby K, 
and really suspected someone was harming babies on his unit, that he hadn't done precisely that. Their robust exchange in court, which starts with Mr Myers, has been voiced by actors. You have a duty to look after children on your unit. If you think someone is deliberately harming them, you do your best to protect them. I did my best by raising concerns to senior executive level medical management. Concerns were first raised by my colleague Dr. You are following a protocol, but sometimes protocol is not enough. You know what I'm saying? Morality overtakes that. And I'm not a go go tell the police person, but this I'm I'm instantly. Hey yo, this ain't nothing gangster. Like this is real life. Dr. Breary, in February we raised them again. <sighs> Lucy let me continue to work on this department for another four months or so? In retrospect, I wish we had bypassed them and gone straight to the police. We by no means were playing judge and jury at any point, but the association was becoming clearer and clearer. We were in an unprecedented situation. No one trains us for this. We were not thinking, could this be deliberate harm? So obviously, back in June, July 2015, Dr. J. Ram and Dr. Breary were having conversations, this association. Like, you gotta remember, man, these doctors, y'all are geniuses. So if y'all say something like, y'all get to think of something like, like it's almost, like I said, like I believe it. So if y'all would have came to me and told me like, oh, Lucy, I think Lucy is doing it. Listen, I would have went and grabbed Lucy by the esophagus. My bad. Let me get to ...had been made because Lucy Letby seemed to always be there mm -hmm. at these unexpected moments uh, when babies were collapsing and dying. But then it was October the same year when these concerns started to escalate and other doctors were getting involved in these conversations, wasn't it? So they said basically that they were talking to their um, colleagues mm. and this was a key part of the prosecution case but it was also a key part of Lucy Letby's defence because she said in court that um, four of these consultants in particular, the gang of four mm. as they were termed in court, um, had it in for her essentially yeah. and were trying to blame her for the failings at the hospital, for mistakes that were made and for the baby's deaths. And actually when she gave evidence later in the trial, that was the accusation she made to Nick Johnson, the prosecutor. She named four consultants, Dr. J. Ram, Dr. Stephen Breary, Dr. John Gibbs and Dr. B, a consultant we haven't been able to name as being out to get her. She said the four were involved in a conspiracy to blame her for the baby's deaths. You may also remember that she told the jury tried to flip it. that when she'd written the word bastards on another of the notes, she was referring to Dr. Breary and Dr. J. Ram because she was angry that they pointed the finger at her. Are you suggesting there's some sort of agreement between medical staff to get you? In the consultants group, I do believe, yes. Four doctors, a gang of four, let's call them. What's the conspiracy? They have apportioned blame onto me. The motive? I yeah, what's the reason? I believe to cover failings at the hospital. And, and it was pointed out in court that um, actually the... That's, that's cap. Who would believe that? To cover failings? Yes, you're low enough in the totem pole where it's like, get rid of her, but like, it's not, you're not significant enough to put that on. Like, it doesn't make sense for them to do that to you. Consultants did everything they could really to find a medical reason, a medical explanation for what was going on um, because nobody really wanted to believe that one of their own was attacking babies and doing what they said was the unthinkable. Yeah, and in fact, um, it was so unthinkable that Dr. Stephen Breary actually said, not Lucy, not nice Lucy when this was suggested. I'm not even gonna cap Lucy don't even look like she would do nothing like that but that's the thing man in the real world you can't play it by book like by looks like that saying is golden don't judge a book by its cover it goes both ways don't think somebody is too nice for something don't think somebody looks too mean to do no because nobody wanted to believe it so the other reason that the court was told by the prosecutor that this allegation that the gang of four were mm. out to get her um, was fanciful, according to the prosecutor, Nick Johnson, 
uh, was because these four experienced consultants had ignored the key medical evidence in this case, which was the insulin list. Yeah, so when they went to the managers, they didn't actually know that two of the babies on the unit had already been poisoned. And he, Mr Johnson pointed that out, saying, you know, it was amazing that they'd missed essentially the best bit of evidence against her. Um, and it was only years later when the police got involved and started investigating that they actually unearthed these two blood samples mm. that were taken eight months apart, baby boys from two separate sets of twins that were poisoned eight months apart. Yeah. And that's the, this the type of mistakes or overlooks that be angering me too, because if y'all would have caught that, maybe others wouldn't have had to lose their lives as well. And the insulin was found to be in these blood samples and it had to be insulin that was manufactured, it couldn't have been produced by them themselves. No, it was given to them deliberately, and because they didn't need it, it was given to them to cause harm. Do you agree that Baby F was poisoned with insulin? Yes. Knowing what you know about insulin readings, blood sugar readings, what are the realistic possibilities in Baby L's case? I don't believe any member of the unit would make a mistake. Mistake is not an option? Yes. Deliberate poisoning, but not you. Insulin has been added by somebody, but not me. So we know that attack on baby F came the day after his brother, baby E, was murdered. Um, and that was a particularly moving moment in court, Liz. I remember uh, the description of what happened there. Yeah, so the manner of his attack was just horrendous. Um, the way it was described in court, he was attacked by having what they think was a metal instrument shoved down his throat, which triggered this bleeding. And as they desperately tried to resuscitate him, he lost a quarter of the blood in his body. And, you know, obviously that one of the doctors that was present there was describing. There's a lot of things that's going on on Earth where it, it's restoring faith in humanity. But then you hear something like this, it's like 20 steps forward, 40 steps back, man. It's 100 steps back this moment and was clearly traumatized by what he saw. Doctors began full CPR when his heart stopped beating. The court heard Dr Harkness led the resuscitation efforts alongside nurses Caroline Oakley, Lucy Letby and another colleague Belinda Williamson. Jurors were told the resuscitation... Like Lucy Letby, like something's wrong with her because she would do it and then she would stand there and watch and try to help resuscitate. Like she was getting enjoyment, fulfillment. Like she was like unravel that. Like what's the patient was distressing because baby E continued to bleed profusely from his nose and mouth while the medical team desperately tried to save him. Over the course of the next 47 minutes with his parents close by, the medical team gave baby E. Did they do autops, autops, what's the word? Autopsies for any of the children. He five doses they of did, adrenaline right? to try and stimulate his heart. Yes, and unusually, like in the case of baby C, baby E's heartbeat returned momentarily, just after 1am. But by then he had been without oxygen for around 15 minutes, and doctors soon realised he was unlikely to survive. CPR was stopped at around 1.23 a.m. and baby E was given to his parents to cuddle as he passed away. He was formally pronounced dead at 1.40 a.m. Now, after he died, um, the initial thought from the doctors was that he died from natural causes. They advised the parents not to have a post-mortem and that was, was a wrong decision, really. Wow. Well, it was a really terrible mistake, and... Because if they would have got a post-mortem, see, see, I just said that. If they would have got a post-mortem on this, they would have figured it out. Um, initially, the consultant thought that he'd got some kind of stomach bleed due to a, a kind of bowel condition that premature babies yeah. get. Um, but um, that was later disproved by the medical experts. So the decision not to have a post-mortem meant that actually, although they suspected that he'd been assaulted, 
like in the case of one of the triplets, cool, Baby O, yeah. who had a terrible liver injury. Um, they couldn't actually prove that Baby E had been assaulted. And when the consultant gave evidence in court, it produced... There's more and more and more and more errors. Of course, we can look at it from the outside or in hindsight and be like, oh man, they should have did that. But in the moment, you know, as medical professionals, they just going off, you know, because obviously they're not thinking that somebody... But at this point, they have suspicions. They should have been doing everything. It's a really dramatic moment. Yes, in court, the doctor turned to Baby E's parents, who were sitting in the public gallery behind her, and publicly apologised for this. She said she regretted that decision, because obviously a post-mortem would have been very helpful in explaining exactly why Baby E died. The doctor went on to explain to the jury why she changed her mind about Baby E's cause of death, and why she thought the bowel condition was no longer to blame. Yeah, she said she'd since examined the results of blood tests and x-rays taken in the run-up to his death. She said his observations were very stable up until he collapsed, which didn't fit with what would have happened if he'd had the bowel problem. She also said she'd failed to give enough weight to the x-ray, taken around an hour before his death, and had been normal. So because there was no post-mortem for baby E, the prosecution didn't really have the medical evidence to prove that he had been assaulted, even though the evidence of the bleeding was pretty conclusive. Um, but in the case of baby O, who was also, the prosecution said, viciously assaulted by Lucy Letby, it was a different matter because that was clear on the post-mortem records, wasn't it? Yeah, so he had a post-mortem mm. um, and okay. the the post-mortem results were looked at by the prosecution's expert, Dr. Andreas Marnarides, who found a severe liver injury, which he said was akin really only to um, children he'd seen that suffered injuries in road traffic accidents. And of course, baby O was a triplet. His brother was baby P, and they were both murdered by Lucy Letby within hours actually of her coming back onto the ward after she'd been on holiday to Ibiza. And in fact, what we also heard was that the prosecution say that she also planned to kill the third triplet, but he was moved off the ward. His parents essentially begged doctors uh, from the transport team when they arrived to take baby P. Sadly, he died and they begged and begged the doctors to take the, the surviving triplet out of, out of the Countess to another hospital. Good thing they did. Like, what was wrong with Lucy? Did she, like, could she not have kids and was taking it out on people? Or, like, what? This baby boy was a triplet, and he and his two brothers were identical because they shared a placenta. Now, while triplets themselves are rare, identical triplets, conceived naturally like these baby boys were, are even more unusual. So rare, in fact, it happens in just one in 200 million births. The prosecution say Lucy Letby didn't just murder Baby O, she also killed his brother, Baby P. She's accused of injecting both boys with air into their tummies and bloodstreams, causing them to collapse and die. Statement to the court, the triplet's mother described what she'd witnessed. On June 23rd, a doctor came onto the ward and said Baby O's stomach had swollen and he was needing help to breathe, so they had put a tube down his throat and lots of medical staff were rushing around. I remember the nurse Lucy was there all the time. The staff seemed to be in a state of panic. I just sat outside the nursery. I couldn't bring myself to go closer. My partner was closer to what was going on. Baby O kept arresting and he changed colour, which I saw later with Baby P. He was swollen all over his body. Another doctor called Steve arrived. I think he was one of the main doctors. He told me that things weren't looking good for baby O. And if he did manage to survive, he would likely have brain damage. It's a tough watch, man. So it might be best if... We can't even see nothing, but just to hear it all is tough. ...if he didn't survive. This went on all afternoon, and eventually, baby O passed away at about 5pm. This whole episode had come as a bolt out of the blue. On the face of it, everything seemed to be going so well for the triplets. It was never explained to us how the sudden downturn in Baby O's health happened. As a family, we were naturally devastated. And it was actually during Baby P's deterioration 
when Lucy Letby made what one of her colleagues described was an absolutely shocking comment. I remember saying the transport team are going to be here soon, almost thinking out loud. I was literally counting the minutes before they arrived. Staff nurse Letby said, he's not leaving here alive, is he? Which I found absolutely shocking at the time. Did you report that? What, like, that's almost admission in my mind. What do you mean by that comment? I turned around and said, don't say that. All these years on, seven years on, that memory is still very much alive in my mind. Now, obviously, we know about that comment that was made. We know she liked the drama. We know she reveled in all of that drama. Um, but what she also craved was the attention, the attention of a certain doctor who we called Dr. A because we couldn't name him during the trial. And he was described in court as her boyfriend, although she said they were just friends and that she loved him as a friend. But what we know is that he's married, uh, but they texted long into, into the, the night, night yeah. on many occasions. Yeah, so they went on trips to look. Man, I ain't even gonna lie to you, man. Never, never get involved with somebody at work. London together, he bought her chocolates, he let her use his car to get home. And um, actually the first time that we saw any emotion from her was when he came to give evidence and stepped into the witness box for the first time. And she broke down in tears and she actually tried to leave the dock. But as soon as he gave his name to the court, Lucy Letby became tearful and stood up from her seat. She appeared to try to leave the glass panel dock by the doors which leads to the cells. The trial judge, Mr Justice Goss, watched the drama unfold and asked Lucy Letby's solicitor to just see what the problem is. She had a hushed conversation with the dock officer and her solicitor before composing herself, although she did continue to wipe her eyes with a tissue as the doctor started to give his evidence. The jury was not given an explanation for her reaction and the doctor was allowed to continue with his evidence. Were you in love with him? No, I loved Dr A as a friend. I wasn't in love with him. One of the theories put to the jury Cap. was that Lucy Letby attacked babies in order to get Dr. A into the room to get his attention. Yes, we already knew. Yo, what? You did that to get that man attention to get him in the same room? Like, grow some. Knew that on a number of occasions when babies on the unit collapsed, it was Dr. A who was crash bleeped to attend. What Mr. Johnson has now alleged to the court is that Lucy Letby murdered and deliberately harmed some of the children in order to get Dr. A into the room. Bro, straight weirdo. That's the weirdest thing I ever heard in my life. Like, you can do so many other things to get somebody's attention, but you do that? Did you enjoy being in these crisis situations with Dr. A? No. Did it give you something to talk to him about and message him about? No. Dr. A and I were friends. Something in common you could share? No. And it was after the deaths of baby O and baby P, which was in June 2016, that things came to a head. And because of what we heard in court, we call this episode The Tipping Point. So we called it the tipping point because that's what one of the consultants said in his evidence and by June 2016 they'd been repeatedly to the hospital managers to try and act to keep the babies safe and nobody had done anything and these two babies died and shouldn't have died and they realised that something had to be done. The jury have heard from some of the key consultants on the neonatal unit who said they demanded that Lucy Letby be removed from the ward in June 2016. They claim they went to hospital managers more than once as their suspicions grew, but on each occasion they claim their request was refused and their concerns were ignored. Dr Breary insisted he repeatedly tried to flag concerns through the correct channels at the hospital. Pressed about exactly why he didn't make a formal complaint or go to the police, Dr Breary told Mr Myers... I'm telling you man, the hospital wasn't hospitaling one could protect them. Making it more simplistic than it was, it was not something that anyone wanted to consider, that a member of staff was harming babies. Actually, the senior nursing staff on the unit didn't... Like, like I said earlier, like, you think about it. If doctors are raising concerns 
they might be on to something because they went to school for like 15 years. I'm not saying that equates to like common sense, but like they, they know a little something smarter than your average. Quick critical thinking. They, they, come on now. I believe this could be true up until the point and beyond. But of course, nobody like it's that whoever's in that head seat don't want to take that type of accountability where somebody that staff looks bad on us, looks bad on us. I'm like, bro, so you can let it ride. When the triplets died. That year was spent with myself and colleagues with increasing suspicion after every episode. None of us wanted to believe it either. This all became very exceptional and it took a step back to think about it. The nature of these collapses, the unexpected nature of them, the lack of response to resuscitation, the unusual rash noted on a number of occasions, and each time the association with Nurse Letby. And he told the court that once Lucy Letby was removed from the unit, a few days after the triplets died, there were no more events. It was the same staff doing the same job, and there were no sudden collapses. So Lucy Letby was removed from the ward and allocated to what was called other duties after the death of the two boys. Dr John Gibbs Suspender. described their deaths as the tipping point in court. After the deaths of the triplets, because concerns had reached a tipping point, safety measures were introduced and one of the key safety measures which the consultants were insistent on was Lucy Letby be removed from the neonatal unit. That was not a simple, straightforward decision. A month later, senior managers wanted staff nurse Letby to come back on the unit and we said that should only happen if CCTV was put in each room in the unit. Finally. It shouldn't have been, it shouldn't have happened at all. First of all, y'all seen the change. Nothing, when she was there, unalivings happened. When she wasn't, everything was cool. The thought to bring her back, Probably because she was pushing to come back. Like, oh, man, I got to scratch this itch. Oh, weird self. I hope somebody scratch her itch in prison. Finally, finally in uh. July 2018, Lucy Letby was arrested. She was arrested in a dawn raid by police from Cheshire at her home in Chester, just a couple of miles from the hospital. And at that point, her house was searched, as was the home of her parents, mm who lived in Hereford. And in these police searches, they found um, what they described as a treasure trove of information, medical documents, post-it notes, and pictures of cards on her phone that she'd written. And in Baby Eye's case, they found uh, a condolence card that, they, that she actually sent to her parents on the day of her funeral. There are no words to make this time any easier. Bro, this is like spitting in their face. You did it, you watched it unfold, you watched the resuscitation, and then you spit in their face by sending a card. It was a real privilege to care for Baby Eye and get to know you as a family. A family who always put Baby Eye first and did everything possible for her. She will always be a part of your lives and we will never forget her. Thinking of you today and always, sorry I cannot be there to say goodbye. It's a weird thing to do, to That's take sickening. a picture of a card and keep it on your phone for years. Was there any clue why? She probably looked back in the, at the card like, huh? You know what I'm saying? Like, that, like, no, what other reason would you do that? Like, look, look what I did. Ha. Huh. Caught the M, got away with the M, watched the M, watched them try to resuscitate. She just said that, that she did that routinely with cards that she sent to people because she wanted to remember what she'd written. Mm. Um, and there was another card on, the, on her phone, which was a thank you card that the parents of Baby E and Baby F had actually sent to all the nurses on the unit yeah. to say thank you when Baby F was well enough to go home. And that was also found on her mm. phone. And actually, these souvenirs, the police called them, or killing trophies, they didn't end there, did they? Detective Constable Colin Johnson is an exhibits officer with Cheshire Police. Now, he was called to give evidence and took the jury through what police discovered at Lucy Letby's three-bedroom semi in the Blaken suburb of Chester. One of the most dramatic moments so far in the court case has been a post-it note. This was found at Lucy Letby's home during a police search. Why was this such a big moment in, in the case? 
Yeah, this is a key moment, Caroline. The jury was shown the scribbled post-it notes on screens in the courtroom. It was found at her home in Chester. In the note, she describes herself as evil. The note also said, I did this, I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough. She also wrote, I will never have children or marry or know what it's like to have a family. But she also had written, I haven't done anything wrong and I feel very alone and scared. There are no words. I am an awful person. I pay every day for that. I can't breathe. I can't focus. Kill myself right now. Overwhelming fear, panic. I'll never have children or marry. I'll never know what it's like to have a family. No hope. I haven't done anything wrong. I don't deserve to live. I did this. Why me? I killed them on purpose because I'm not good enough for them. And I'm a horrible, evil person. You ain't gotta be good enough for them. You're not their parents. I don't deserve mum and dad. World is better off without me. So... If that's the case, why you take it out on them? I am evil, I did this. There's the confession. It sounds like she was like, unaliving them. And looking at them as herself, because she wasn't good enough for her parents or something. So something crazy going on. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's what the prosecution said. The defense said that um, it wasn't a confession. They said, that it was written by Lucy Letby when she was moved off the unit, out of the job she said she loved into the admin role because she felt isolated, because she felt anxiety, she was upset. Mm. Um, and they said it was the anguished outpourings of a woman who felt destroyed by losing her job. I know lawyers have a job to do, but they shouldn't even took her case. But also, if all that's true, at this point, she knew she was being investigated by the police. They'd spoken to colleagues at the hospital, so they knew that word was getting back to her. Why keep them? Well, that's the big question. The police actually think that she kept them on purpose, potentially for them to find. They can't work out why they would be in the house so many months after she knew that she was being investigated. The yellow post-it note contained the first names of the triplets involved in the case and underneath had been written, Today is your birthday, but you aren't here, and I'm so sorry for that. I'm sorry you couldn't have the chance at life, and for the pain. I can't do this anymore. The court heard that police found the log, along with a blood test report for Baby M, in a plastic supermarket carrier bag under Lucy Letby's bed when they searched her home, close to the hospital. She told detectives she must have forgotten to empty her pockets before leaving work and inadvertently taken the paper towel home. She said it may have been put to one side and forgotten about, but she denied keeping it as a reminder of an attack on baby M. No, you kept trophies. A six year investigation, a court case lasting the best part of a year. Uh, rafts and rafts of evidence, as we've seen, that implicate Lucy Letby in the murders and attempted murders of these babies. Strange, odd behaviour throughout this period. And yet, between 2015 and 2016, when all of this was going on, no one noticed that she was behaving oddly. Because she wasn't behaving oddly or strangely at work, she was a really competent nurse. You know, you've seen the pictures of her, she's, you know, she looks like the girl next door. There's nothing remarkable about her at all. She was a killer operating in plain sight. So, after months and months and months of this trial, years and years of this investigation, what we do... I genuinely H-A-T-E her. I have a strong H-A-T for H-A-T-E for Lucy. Let be. You know, is how these babies died and were harmed. We know where they died and were harmed, and we know when they died and were harmed. What we don't know, and more importantly, what their families, who, Liz, as you've witnessed, have behaved with the most amazing bravery, yeah. courage, um, composure. Yeah, I wouldn't have had no composure. They said she was behind a glass little box thing for her protection. Hey, listen, 
utterly dignified through Throughout all the whole, of this. Yes. What they'll never know, we don't think, is the why. And, and also, Caroline, we, we, we won't actually know how many more because we do know that the police are still investigating Lucy Letby and we know that they are now going back to when she began her training um, and she wasn't only just at the Countess, she also um, worked for periods of time at Liverpool Women's Hospital and so they are going to back to look at thousands of babies that pass through these neonatal units and um, they haven't ruled out charges in the future and that she will be back in court at a later date. This is sick. She is the spawn of Satan. Uh, she will, you know, answer to a higher power one day. Um, if she was in the state of Texas, that day would be sooner than later. Um, what else? What else? What else I got to say, man? What else? Um, R.I.P. to all those innocent lives. Condolences to the families. And, and if you live, if you work at a hospital, a school, uh, an old folks home, somewhere like that, man, you see something, say something, man. Don't leave it up to the policies and regulations, bro. Just just jump off that limb and, and trust yourself. Say something. Because you could be saving a lot of lives. Hold on. This is disgusting.